before we start, mm -hmm. just I have to tell you something. Okay. Before I forget, because I have been okay. meaning to tell you this. Yeah. So I try not to eavesdrop on other people's conversations because it's not polite. But when you work in a building with so many other people, you overhear people's conversations. It happens. Uh-huh. And I heard a woman talking to somebody. I wasn't interested in what they were saying, but I couldn't help noticing that she kept using the phrase FYI, like a lot, more than anybody needs to. Just mm -hmm. FYI, I mean, this this is what I did this morning. And just oh. FYI, this is just, I, before I say this is how I feel about, like that yeah. kind of thing. Uh-huh. And I had, so naturally I had FYI stuck in my head for the rest of the night. And I realized something. What? You know what FYI stands for, don't you? For your information? Correct, but do you know what else it can stand for? F*** you, Ivan! Oh, f*** you, Ivan! Ah! I was gonna say f*** you, but then I was like, what's the I? <laughs> FYI. Ever since I, ever since I realized that, I was like, okay, I hereby call, I hereby call to order this meeting of FYI, also known as f*** you, Ivan! Seriously. Yes. I love it. I'm here for it. I appreciate that. And welcome to Into the Fold, a show where two best friends share their love of Lee Bardugo's Grishaverse chapter by chapter. I'm Jeff. And I'm Juliana. And this week we are talking about Siege and Storm chapters three and four. And Jeff, it's it's been a day. There's a lot Has of it? snow outside my window. There's also snow outside my window. And you saw the video that I, sh uh, that I sent you. Yeah, that's weird. I mean, that's that's a, the joke around here in Indiana or Kentucky. If you've never been to either of those states, that's the joke is how do you like the weather? Well, good, because it'll change in like five minutes. That's how quick it was. I went into yeah. work the other night. Nothing. I get off work. Snow everywhere. I wake up after I got home from work. Nothing. I get ready to go back to work again. Snow everywhere. I slid at least once, but so did everybody else who was driving last night. It was unavoidable. Yeah, I'm very glad that I'm not driving outside because I took Myrtle's outside to walk and literally because the wind is like 40, 50 mile an hour winds right now, you can't see. You I can't. won't wear my sunglasses when I go outside. Like. Oh my gosh. So that way I don't, I can see kind of. I hope so. Because my sister-in-law, bless her heart, she got in a car accident. Everybody was okay. It was just a fender bender. They got it worked out, so she'll be all right. But it's not fun that it happened. She was on her way to get her booster. So now uh, she has to reschedule that. And that a... was the day they had to take their dog to get snipped. Oh, so two appointments just went awry. I mean, talk about a day. It was a day for them. First of all, it made my heart happy when you said Siege and Storm chapters three and four, because that almost sounded like a rhyme. That was nice. Yeah. It's nice when it works out that way. But yes. before we do that, we should discuss the news from the front. News. News. Yes. Thank you, Jeff. Leave our Dugo. <laughs> our lovely queen, our author, she went and eloped this week and Jeff I would highly recommend you check out the pictures of her if you haven't already I've linked them in our doc but she looked beautiful in her wedding dress and what a pretty venue it was too I went and I looked at the venue on Instagram as well and it's such a pretty venue um, I'm not exactly sure where it was off the top of my head do you know what my favorite thing is about the pictures apart from the fact that they are very beautiful as you said mm -hmm. The groom is in one of the pictures, and his back is to the camera. <laughs> yeah. We are definitely <laughs> respecting privacy here. We definitely are. And I mean, we, see, you never know. With some things like that, with some people who are in the public eye, their partner doesn't necessarily want to mix too, too much with that side of it. And it's honestly, it's fine. Yeah. I mean, I fully respect that, and... It was just so nice to see these pictures pop up on my Instagram this week because they were just so pretty and a nice little a nice little treat as the week went on. So congratulations to Lee. 
and her husband for their elopement. We wish you all the best and yay, 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 yay. I'm going to call him in my head Mr. Bardugo until I know anything else to call him. Yeah, I'm assuming she's keeping her own name because especially as an author, you want to make sure that you've established your name as like kind of a brand. So well, I'm yeah. assuming I'm assuming she'll stay as Lee Bardugo. Things like that happen all the time. You know, celebrities get married to other celebrities or they get married to people who aren't celebrities and then names stay the same because it's a branding thing. I mean, Lee Bardugo is a beautiful, strong name and now it's got mm -hmm. a legacy attached to it. So yeah. I'm sure that any partner of hers would understand that. Oh, yeah. And she is such a strong-willed woman that I can't imagine that her partner wouldn't be on the same page as her with that. So congratulations to both of them. And speaking of our author, the episode that we did a little while back, the bonus episode, we talked about the Penn Faulkner interview, and we were able to find a link to that interview. So if you wanted to watch the actual interview of Lee from the Penn Faulkner Foundation, we will put that on our social medias, and you can access it there, or you can go to their website, penfaulkner.org, and just search Shadow and Bone, and it should come up in their website search feed. I highly recommend that you do. Yeah, we had a really great time watching it. And obviously, we had such a good time that we did a bonus episode on it. Well, yeah. And we didn't even get to talk about everything that was in the interview. We just pulled out the parts that we thought, you know, we wanted to discuss. But because yeah. it would have been impossible to cover the whole thing. So people definitely should check out the interview for themselves. Yeah, and uh, obviously completely free. So just go check it out. Well worth your time. And other than that, we have... The starting of the filming of season two of Shadow and Bone, which we obviously anticipated giving the cast announcements that we announced on the last episode. They have started filming, which is really exciting. We still don't have a release date for the actual show itself, but listeners, we're waiting on that and we'll keep you informed. And what else do we have on the news today, Jeff? We have a couple of birthdays that happened uh, since the last time that we were here. Um, mm -hmm. We're recording this on January 29th. And mm -hmm. so uh, a couple of days ago, on the 27th, uh, we had Freddie Carter's birthday. He turned 29, which is yeah. incredible because he's he's pretty close to our age. I thought he was older. I thought he was younger. Oh, I thought he was older. <laughs> I thought, see, I maybe it's just because of the character of Kaz Brecker. I thought that he was one of those people who is significantly younger than he looks, but he looks older because he's an old soul and he's had to live a lot mm. of life in his few years that he's been around. Yeah. Maybe that was just projecting the character. I don't know. But we also had um, on the 25th, uh, 38th birthday to Simon Sears, who plays Ivan. Yeah, FYI, so, Jeff, his birthday is the Yeah, 25th. FYI. It, we could just say FYI, and it would save us some time. But for yeah. this one, I'll say, yay, Simon, but f*** you, Ivan. Yes. <laughs> Ooh, that kind of rhymes, too. Yay, Simon, but f*** you, Ivan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's We've fun. written a poem. We're poets, and we didn't even know it, Jeff. We, I would like to uh, add an S. We're poets, and we didn't even know it. That way it's cute, you know. Oh, okay, yes. I can get behind that. I like I like making it an exact rhyme. That's fine with me. While we're working on our poem skills, we have one more piece of news. What else? Yes, so Lee actually just hosted a discussion with the author Marie Ruta Rutazinski, I believe is how you pronounce her last Rutkowski. name. Rutkowski. Rutkowski. Thank you, Jeff. Rutkowski. Rutkowski. Marie Rutkowski, who wrote a book called Real Easy, which I read the description for, and it sounds very similar or in the same vein as Ninth House. So it seems as though that is why Lee was talking with this author. And also, they seem to be friends from what I gathered. I watched a little bit of it, and I haven't gotten to watch the rest of it, but it's queued up in my, in my tabs up above right now. So we'll finish watching that a little bit later. But if you wanted to get just a little bit more Lee Bardugo content, just because she doesn't have that much out there, actually. So any little bit we can get, we'll take. And watch a lovely interview with her and another author. You can head on over to Proudcast slash Marie Rutazinski. And I will put that link in our Rutkowski. social media as well. Rutkowski. R-U-T-K-O-S-K-I. Rutkowski. Rutkowski. There you go. There you go. Okay. I'm yeah, got it. Words. Okay. Yeah, got it. Probably should have took that one then. Yeah. Oh, well, your fault. You're lost, Jeff. So that is all we have for the news from the front. So thank you, 
for that. And then we will move into the voice of the people. And this week on the voice of the people, we have a question that we put out to our listeners and we asked, would you chew Jerda? And we got some good responses back to that. And we had our friend Marjolaine who said, no, thank you. We also had Claire, who's Claire Loves Books on Instagram. She said, yep, 100%. And I said, show off those orange teeth, girl. Yeah. I have a feeling that the kind of people who are using this stuff, they don't really care what color their teeth is. You know, you know what this, this brings up for me? I've never thought about this until just now. Tobacco. You hear about people bathing, probably not as often as they ought to in the series. Uh-huh. I don't think anybody in this universe ever talks about brushing their teeth. Do they have toothbrushes? Please That's tell me they have toothbrushes. Point. That's a very good point. I mean, I have to believe that even if they don't have at what we now have in terms of dental mm-hmm. technology, however you want to call that, they have to have some kind of way of taking care of their teeth. Maybe Grisha don't have to because maybe that's part of Grisha staying healthy by using their power. Maybe they can naturally fight plaque. I don't know. Automatic teeth cleaner. Maybe. But, I mean, do people, can people brush their teeth? I I think it's less of a question of can and more of a question of do they. I choose to believe that they are brushing their teeth because I don't like to imagine a world where people don't do that, especially not a world that I like spending a lot of time in. Yeah, I think let's make a canon, Jeff, that the people of the Grishaverse have good teeth because they brush them at least once a day. Excellent. Okay, and then then we had a response from our friends at Spinner's Court Design who said, nope, 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 big nope. Interesting that the ones at Spinner's Court would be the ones to say nope several times, though, because they Mm -hmm. make, if you haven't seen Spinner's Court design, you guys need to check them out on Instagram as soon as you are hearing this, because they make incredible stuff, including they have a crowdfunding campaign to create these amazing handmade, guys, they're making keftas, like not just the adorable cute decorative keftas made out of paper that are available in our etsy store by the way yeah. our etsy store is still open Free- you can get a kefta but Free trading post they are making keftas you can wear and they yeah. are beautiful and the material looks awesome so please look at them but because they're so busy making those you'd think they could use some chewable super coffee mm. You know, maybe they're just sticking to regular coffee because the question is still out there, Jeff. Is there coffee in this universe? We have mixed memories of it. You and I could not like definitively remember if there was coffee in this series. So we will find out at some point if there actually is coffee in the Grishaverse without us self-inserting it (laughs) into the into the Grishaverse. But as of right now, I will say that they are potentially drinking coffee. Once we get to that point, whether we decide it exists or not in this world. Potentially. Allie said, nope, I don't want orange teeth. I will stick with drinking simple coffee. So Allie is choosing to acknowledge that coffee exists. But, you know, Allie, we haven't gotten that far yet. And we will let you know if the reality of coffee that you are living in is real or fake once we get to that point. See, I get it, because if you have the option to drink real coffee, then sure. Because I think what some people might be thinking is, would they... would they carry Jerda around in their pockets with them in their everyday lives now and chew it regularly the way yeah. you might pull out and chew a piece of gum? So mm-hmm. if you have the option of coffee and you can say no to that, then sure. But it makes sense for these characters to do it because we don't know if they have real coffee. We just talked about we 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 don't know. And they are in a position where they can't just brew a cup of coffee and carry it around with them or they can't carry a thermos with whatever they got, but they can carry a little piece of Jerda in their pocket. It's convenient. I imagine their hostel doesn't have a Keurig in the lobby. The I Darkling probably has a really nice Nescafe machine, though. Yeah, he probably has, like, a hot pink um, Keurig that he had custom made, and it's got prints of, like, Ariana Grande lyrics all over mm, the outside. Yeah. I'm so into you, into you. That's what it says on the side. If you want it, take it. Yeah. He just needs to reaffirm everything for himself every second of the day. He's fabulous. He must know that now. (laughs) 
So today we talk about chapters 3 and 4 of Siege and Storm. If you haven't read the chapters yet, feel free to hit the pause button, go back and read them, and then come back and join us. If you would prefer not to, we will be breaking down each chapter before we discuss it. And here is your summary for chapter 3. So the party continues to travel across dangerous waters so treacherous they are known as the Bone Road, which sounds terrifying, and the weather is terrible, as if traveling across the Bone Road wasn't bad enough. And Alina begins to suspect that they're looking for an amplifier, but she's not completely sure until she has yet another dramatic conversation with the Darkling, as if he has any other kind of conversation. So the Darkling tells Alina that they are in fact trying to find Moritzova's amplifiers, and he threatens to torture Alina if Mal doesn't use his super tracking skills to find the Sea Whip, which is the one that they are specifically looking for on these dangerous waters. And then the Darkling sheds some light, lol, on why the Volcra didn't destroy him on the fold. He tells her about some basic Grisha theory, or as close to Grisha theory as we really get, and his own lack of feelings and why they are not existent. Mal insists that he can track the Sea Whip in a about a week, at first just to keep the Darkling from peeling Alina's skin off, which he literally threatens to do that, but then, right at the end of the chapter, he actually finds the Sea Whip. This was a long chapter. It was a lot in one chapter, and yet, based on that summary, when I read the whole thing through, it doesn't feel like a long chapter. It's just, it's all the talking between the characters. Yeah. And I blame, you know what? I blame the Darkling. I mean, we all know when the Darkling shows up to a scene, he's going to do the same thing that Voldemort does where they show up and it's a monologue. It's a monologue. It's a show. It's a performance. Thank you very much. Here's the program. Please take your seat. You're number G56. Please take a seat. No, no feet up on the seat in front of you, please. And just sit back and relax because it's time for a Darkling monologue. Yup. Do not make plans when the Darkling says he wants to talk to you about something because you are going to be there for a while. Yeah, and he's just so evil. He's just, this whole chapter just made me think like, wow, he is just a terrible person. He really does. And where where Taylor's alter appearance, he's like a tailor of emotions. He is the, yes. a, the ultimate master manipulator because you can tell, you see him having a conversation with many different characters and he switches it up so that he tries to appeal to what he thinks will manipulate them it's like he has to have that manipulation in a conversation or he doesn't see the point in talking to somebody like he talks to alina and he's still on this thing about you're extraordinary you have to accept this power this is who you really are embrace the dark side anakin you know that kind of thing but then mm -hmm. he brings in mal and he says you know what last time i threatened to kill you if she didn't do what i wanted but this time i'm going to torture her because i know that you know that i know that you know that i know that you know that i won't kill her but i will torture her for eternity if you don't use your super tracker skills to find the sea whip and then he yeah. does it's i in my head the darkling is kind of the conductor he is conducting every single tiny little detail or the like a fashion curator almost or a fashion designer the mm -hmm. darkling is a very very high-end fashion designer he's like no darling we can't have pink shoes we must have chartreuse shoes and he has to have everything be exact, exactly. And he's like, you gave me the one and a half inch kitten heel. I needed the one and five eighth inch, inch kitten heel. Thank you very much. There's a difference. Like, you know that the Darkling was upset the day he found out that Karl Lagerfeld died. Oh, devastated. 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 Ivan came in to try to bring him his coffee from his Ariana Grande Keurig that we now know exists, and he says, Not now, Ivan! Can't you see? I am in grief. We've lost Lagerfeld, Ivan. Oh. He, does ne he never actually cries, though. He just like sits there and is like, He never sheds agony. tears, but like he does that thing where he acts like he's about to cry, like he makes the face like, Why? Like people yeah. do. Uh-huh. Yeah, just playing all the emotions like a giant piano. 
I love it. I'm here for it. We all know Juliana likes the Darkling as a character. He's a terrible person, but I think he's well written. And I like that. He's also well read because he has clearly, I don't know if he reads a lot, but clearly he reads when he needs to. Because what's fascinating to me, I mentioned in the summary that he gets into some Grisha theory, but it's where Mm -hmm. it comes from. Because he's not reading the books that they teach to little Grisha boys and Grisha girls in Grisha school when they're teaching them the Grisha facts of life. He's reading The Lives of Saints, the book that the creepy, crawly apparat gave to Alina. That's where he's getting his evidence about where the Moritzova's amplifiers are coming from, and more importantly, why Alina can and should use all of them. Because every Mm -hmm. other book on Grisha theory that talks about amplifiers says you can't have more than one. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll we'll learn more about the both the lives of saints and Moritzova's amplifiers, obviously, as we go on through the books. But it's interesting to hear that callback and just get that familiar sense of nasty inside your stomach when you hear about our favorite character, the apparat. Does it feel a little bit like a conspiracy theory, though, when he's like, oh, I have the proof that this thing is a good idea, but not because of science, because of this other book that no one ever uses to prove anything. I'm reading between the lines, sis. I've got pages of this thing up on my wall, connected with string. I've been putting Mm -hmm. this thing together for years. I've cracked the code, sis. Now let's get you that snack. Well, it is actually kind of a conspiracy theory at this point because no one has actually done that yet. So in in all reality, there actually is no evidence behind it. So he kind of is running his own little conspiracy cult of Morisova's stag in a way. Oh, he's already perpetrating a conspiracy. He's trying to expand his own power by proxy so that he can use the fold to subjugate everybody into doing what he wants. He's conspiring against everybody that isn't him. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's not just a conspiracy theory. It is a conspiracy plot. What a nice guy. He's just such a nice guy. So nice. What a nice guy. One of the thoughts I had reading this chapter, Jeff, is that because all of these interactions that the Darkling has with Alina and the whole like parading her out onto the ship so Mal can see her every day and they can see each other, this happens in full daylight. Yeah. And there are other people on this ship. And I just imagine if I was a Grisha on this ship, to me, this would be like watching my soaps. Like I get to watch my soaps every day when they come out on the ship because it's like, no, I can't see him. There he is. I can't look at him. And the Darkling is like, oh. You can't look at him. It's you killed him. How could you do? How could you do that to my father? It literally has the whole like storyline of a soap opera, and it happens every day. And I just imagine these greasers who are like sitting up there, holding like like eating like peanuts or rations or something, being like, "Wow, this storyline just it just doesn't change, does it?" It's the no, same just thing. another episode of Days of Our Lives of Saints. Yeah. <laughs> Days of Our Lives of Saints. I like yeah, that. That's good. I just made that. That's what that's it's called. That's a good one. This, that was a good this one. soap opera show. Yeah, the Days of Our Lives of Saints. Yeah, that's what they're watching because I just imagine everyone else on the ship is just like, it's the only entertainment they have all day, essentially. Well, well, they've been brought here to do a job. They're trained to follow orders. They don't have entertainment because they don't feel like they need it unless the Darkling says they do. They don't Oh, and think. he says they do in this situation. That's why he's bringing her out into broad daylight to project this whole scenario out into everyone who's gonna use their eyeballs to watch yeah because he's flexing because it's what he does he's that hunky star in the soap opera it fascinates me when he talks about why the vulcra didn't destroy him when he was on the fold because the darkness that came from him that created the fold and then turned them into the vulcra now exists in them so Mm -hmm. they became what they are by absorbing some of his power and because they have that power and because of the whole principle of like calls to like which comes up i feel like at least once a chapter yeah they can't kill him but they can mess him up because it does make me laugh a little when he says it's not an experience i would care to repeat yeah 
I, I'd love to know the details of exactly what happened. And Alina tries to get this out of him, but doesn't get very far because he's the Darkling and he's not going to tell her. But I would love to get the details as to like what exactly happened on the fold. Maybe Ivan knows, but he's not going to tell us anyone. So F you, F, FYI. But FYI. FYI. And I would love to know that, though. I think it's also interesting the fact that as soon as the Nichevoya get close to Alina, she can like feel it in her shoulder and like she still she feels this wound and it's still there, but it's like unhealable. So it just begs the question of like what what exactly is the power of these these creatures and yeah, it's just it, they're kind of a mystery a little bit, I feel like, Jeff. Well, these things are all mysteries. I feel like that's one of the running themes of the books is that what makes Alina so extraordinary, what makes all of these people extraordinary and significant, even if they don't feel like they always are, is that there's no precedent for what they're going through. These things that are happening have never happened before. So there's a lot of things that they're having to figure out. Yeah, and we're kind of figuring a lot of these things out with them as well, too, which makes it, I would say, more of an interesting and well-written book in that capacity. And I would also like to just shout out Lee for her writing skills in this book. Like, I feel as though she's had a significant improvement in her writing skills between just this book and the last book. I wrote down a bunch of stuff that she wrote, and then I stopped doing it because... Her descriptive words and the way she was describing things was just so colorful and vivid that I knew exactly what she meant. You know what inspires me? What? It inspires me. I believe it's somewhere in one of the interviews in the backs of one of her books like that she uh-huh. wrote and then got published with the books as like a bonus piece of material. She talks about how people assume when you become a New York Times bestseller that it means that things suddenly change for you overnight. You can pay off all your bills, buy your house, buy your car, and suddenly like you're set because now you're on the New York Times bestseller list. But that's not at all how it works out. In fact, to, to, to give some context for what she was going through at the time, she mentions that Shadow and Bone was on the New York Times bestseller list. She was working on this book, Siege and Storm. She was living out of a suitcase at her mother's house at the time. Yeah, I remember reading that as well. And we talked about that I briefly at some point too. But yeah, it it definitely changes some things, but not as much as people think, I would say, when it comes to becoming a famous author. It feels like to me being an author is one of those unglorious fame situations where no matter how famous you are, you're not like rolling in diamonds. No. You're not the Darkling. There's no point in that. Yeah. What this moment teaches for me, at least what I think the message is with her sharing that, and I'm very, very glad that she did, is it doesn't completely fix all of your problems, but ending up on the New York Times bestseller list that first time, what it does is it lights the fire under you and makes you say, okay, now we do the real work. Now we yeah. prove this wasn't just a fluke. Now we really start to take this strong base that we have on this mm-hmm. list of distinguished authors and we start to build a whole world out of it. And that's exactly what she did. Yeah, she really sees the opportunity to be able to capitalize on the popularity of her first book. And I feel like this is the perfect sequel so far and obviously we talked about this already this is my favorite book out of the original trilogy so i definitely feel like this was a very good follow-up to shadow and bone on the whole from a literary and writing perspective definitely i want to say two quick things before we move on from this chapter to the next one the first one is i noticed on this read through something that i never really picked up on that closely and i think it's because of how much time we spent talking about Sturmhand, tolia and tamar in the last chapter they mm-hmm. Sturmhand has like a moment where he says a thing in this chapter, but Tolia and Tamar aren't in this chapter at all. They're the new characters. They're the mm-hmm. ones we're getting to know and who I think it's pretty clear are going to become very important to the story, but they're not here because this chapter feels exactly like chapters from the last book. You have 
somebody who is being held captive. You have Alina being forced to do things she doesn't want to. You have Mal tracking an amplifier. You have the Darkling saying more or less the same things he said to Alina already. Because Mm -hmm. this feels like an echo to the book that we have already read. And it feels like because of that and how the chapter ends finding the Sea Whip... We're transitioning from, okay, that was where we were. We're now going to get into a very different kind of story here. It's going to have the same characters. Some of the same stuff's going to go down. But this isn't Alina and Mal trying to figure out what is this world and how do we fit into it. This is going to turn into a, okay, we're here. What do we do about it? Yeah, you actually do make a really good point. Because that's something now that I'm thinking about it, I definitely clocked as well too, where it felt like, I was back in Shadow and Bone for a minute there. I wasn't in Siege and Storm, and I'm really happy. And I know I have a strong feeling that you are too, Jeff. The way that this next chapter that we're going to talk about goes, because this is a fun chapter. It's not as long as the last chapter, but there's a lot of things that happen, and it makes me happy on the inside. Oh, yeah. Chapter four is a fun chapter. I like it. Yeah. It's not all the things in it are fun, but the chapter itself, it's just... It's it's a a, good read. It's a great read. Yeah. Before we get into that, though, since we have mentioned the Sea Whip. Yes. Oh, yeah, you wanted to talk about the Sea Whip. Yes. The second of three amplifiers, and it has a cool story. So I I want to make sure that for anybody who doesn't remember or isn't that familiar, the Sea Whip is a legendary beast in Ravkin folktales. Rosalia was believed to be a cursed dragon prince forced to take the form of a sea serpent and guard the frigid waters of the Bone Road. And in children's stories, he would kidnap beautiful women and take them underwater. There, they had nothing to eat but coral and pearls and eventually starved to death. Once they died, he would sob over them and then go find others. These are stories they mm. told to children. He Sounds kidnapped very women. He kidnapped women. He tried to put them on a plant-based diet. They died because, you know, they're underwater. And then he would cry over them and say, okay, I'm going to try this again because obviously what I'm doing is going to work eventually. I mean, if you keep doing the same thing over and over again and you fail, Jeff, isn't isn't the big overall lesson from that is once in a while you'll get it right? Uh, I think it... it... I mean, it's a fairy tale. It's open to interpretation. But that last part of it, to me, just kind of reads like Albert Einstein's definition of insanity, which is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting expecting different results. results. Jinx. Now, I like... Okay, fine. I'll send it to... You know what? I will send it to your correct address tomorrow. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, That's an inside joke. I I sent your package to the correct address this time. I double-checked. And I am very grateful for that. Thank you. I like the first part of the legend, though. The part where he's a cursed dragon prince and he's forced to take the form of a sea serpent and guard the frigid waters of the bone road. That sounds to me like one of those Norse legends or like one of those Greek myths. Like that to me, that tracks for me with like the legends of yeah. um, other cultures. So that part, I actually like that. I would absolutely love some fan art of this guy before he turns into the Sea Whip because I, and we'll talk about this in a minute. I think the Sea Whip is beautiful from the description that we're given, but we will talk about that in a minute because. We're going to get a description in the next chapter. So shall we head on over into chapter four, Jeff? Yeah, 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 yeah. Chapter four. Okay, so they tracked the sea whip, they found it, and now what? Okay, so in chapter four, the sea whip is beautiful, but then it's dead. Because they kill it. I don't know. And then, woof, woof, the fisherman, quote unquote, ship turns out to be Stormhound's crew, and they are here to save the day. We meet some of the crew rather quickly as Alina and Mal are scooped up onto Stormhound's ship. The Darkling doesn't want his pretties to go, so he throws darkness at them. Alina unleashes her light, but the Nichevoya are here to play too. Bang! Stormhound's squallers summon a legal lightning and distress the Nichevoya long enough for them to motorboat it out of there. They are so happy that they survived and they did it, so much that Stormhound howls with joy and Mal and Alina question what exactly they got themselves into i'm being more fun with my summaries this this book jeff i think my summaries are very fun it's sturmhond 
I'm going the to word pronounce it however is I want. Stir- it's not just the way you said it, it's the way you spelled it. You wrote Sturm Hound like I will a say- dog. Oh, okay. I spelled Nichevoya out so I could pronounce that correctly because I didn't know how to spell it, but I knew how to pronounce it. It was Nichevoya. That so- part actually made me laugh a lot. I. <laughs> You you change the spelling of one word to make it easier to pronounce, but then you change the spelling of another word, and it was actually probably right the first time. I didn't know how to pronounce <laughs> his name. That's genuinely, I was like, I don't know. It does sound like Stormhound. Like the first couple of times I read it, I thought that actually might be what it said, but no, it it's Sturmhond. Sturmhond. Yes. Okay. Well, I pronounced Nietzsche correctly because I genetically wrote, phon- phonetically wrote that out so that way I could pronounce that correctly. I wrote this question and then I answered it in the last chapter. Well, I don't know if we actually answered it or not, but I mm-hmm. just was thinking about it took them forever to find the stag, but they found the sea whip in a week. And I yeah. think the difference is when they were looking for the stag, They were just looking for the stag. It was him and Alina on a romantic montage camping trip in the woods that drove Juliana crazy because she doesn't like it. No, I don't. But this time it was under imminent threat of having her skin pit. We didn't mention this. Well, we did mention it, but not really. That he says, what he says in chapter three is the Darkling is going to peel her skin off one layer at a time, let it heal back, and then start over. Oh, you forgot that she's going to have, he's going to have Ivan reheal it for her. So he's going to do her a favor and have our favorite person reheal her. That is so psychotic. Oh, yeah. The Darkling is not a nice person. Like no. we've established this, he is a bad dude. He is bad dude. Yeah, he news. is a bad dude. And casting Ben Barnes to play him makes this an incredibly difficult character for me because I can't yeah, hate Ben Barnes. He has puppy dog eyes. Yeah, I kind of I love Ben Barnes and I think he's playing the character very well so far, but I and we talked about this too, how Book Darkling and Show Darkling are two separate characters essentially. I because, like that. Yeah. I like that it's different. I I prefer Book Darkling because he's so much like evil and everything that he's inhuman to me. And because Ben Barnes is a human, he can't. And he's so lovingly adorable. He can't really play an inhuman character, but he plays a very good Darkling within the context of the show. So we'll give him that. True. He's perfect for this vision that they have of the Darkling, but he wouldn't play Book Darkling anyway. Yeah. So one of the things that we talked about already briefly, Jeff, is the description of the sea whip. And I really think that the sea whip, I'm excited to see the sea whip in the upcoming seasons of Shadow and Bone because They're I think, need a big budget uh, or just a lot of CGI. That's what the big budget is. Or they could make CGI. Could, good CGI is not cheap. Just ask Peter make, Jackson. Yeah, that's true. We could make one for them, Jeff. Do you think that you and I could make a giant sea serpent that's iridescent and has red eyes? I don't think we're gonna, because speaking for myself, I have plenty of projects. Oh, okay, fine. I mean, I don't really have time to build a giant a giant sea dragon, but, you know, I'll put it on the to-do list at some point. But I think that it is absolutely just a beautiful description. I just love how it's like an iridescent dragon thing and i love the idea that you have in here jeff of the pirates of this universe getting this oh, as a yeah. tattoo oh yeah because i mean sea sea creatures you know nautical sort of tattoos tattoos of bad animals like dragons like those are the kind of things that pirates would get tattoos of so it makes sense that pirates especially the ones who travel the most dangerous waters like this would have tattoos of the sea whip whether they believe in it or not isn't the point i would love it if they were able to get iridescent like shining tattoos of this sea whip that would be so cool if they had it like wrapped around their arm but it was like an iridescent tattoo what if grisha power could somehow make that happen i'm sure taylor could do that Like, they could make, like, animated tattoos or something? That'd be cool. I always need more tattoos. I definitely... My my wife said she would get me a new tattoo. 
I don't know what it's going to be yet, but she said she would oh. get me one. I finished maybe drawing I my get tattoo. A, maybe I should get a sea whip. You could get know. a sea whip. I could. That'd be fun. Yeah. I stand behind that. You know what I like about this chapter? What? Sturmhand was charming yes. when we first met him. And he was having this exchange of power that was hilarious to read between him and the Darkling about who's actually in charge here. Uh-huh. And then Sturmhand gets the better of the Darkling in this one. He says, oh, by the way, um, I'm going to take your hostages and I'm going to take your sea whip. Bye. I'll be in touch. Bye. Yeah, he he's just so, I don't want to say he's manipulative, but he can work a room. He's manipulative in the clever sense. He's manipulative yeah. in the sense that he can outsmart you because he understands how your brain works and then turns that to his advantage so that he can get what he wants without having to get up in your face about it. I wouldn't say he would tell you he's going to steal your watch so that he can steal your wallet because he's not a thief, but it's that kind of... Mentality, mentality about it mm -hmm. he can he can read people he understands people and he yeah. figures out how their brain ticks and then he uses that so that they don't even realize that they are about to be bested by him mm -hmm. until it's too late to stop it whereas yeah. the darkling will get right in your face and say this is what i you're going to do for me and if you mm -hmm. don't do it this is what i'm going to do to you because i have the power but Sturmhand is smarter. Yeah, and he's also a really great captain. I think that he just, he leads his crew very confidently, and they all follow him. And I really love the fact that he pretty much runs his crew based off of trust. And the Darkling, as we see, is a very good fold to this, because the Darkling, and he says this, he pretty much runs his crew off of fear. Yeah, And fear is a very good weapon, but Sturmhan really utilizes the fact that his crew fully trusts him, and it is just a nicer environment to be in on the whole, I would say. Yeah, because the Darkling thinks that intimidating people and subjugating people and the lure of power like his are what are going to bind them to him, but those things can fade. Whereas Sturmhand clearly gets to know his crew and persuades them, I know what you want. I know what you need to get out of this. You can get that if you stick with me. Also, I'm not an obnoxious Ariana Grande super fan. Not that Ariana Grande super fans are obnoxious. I'm just saying this is probably what he's thinking about the Darkling. He yeah. can hear the Ariana Grande being blasted from the Darkling's cabin and he's probably thinking, why doesn't the Darkling just get some headphones? I mean, we can all hear it at this point. The people who are putting up the rigging are like, Ugh, again, why? We've heard this song 20 times already tonight. I love it. Um, you think as he's sailing away, he says to the Darkling, Hey, Darkling, I've got one less problem without you, girl. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I really hope so. Oh, I love it. Yeah, In the last chapter, I was upset about the lack of Tolia and Tamar. And they're back! And they're b not only are they back, Tolia is like picking up Alina and carrying her over his shoulder. And we're all like, um, can I be Alina for just a second? Yeah. Thanks. And then Tamar is running at Mal with a knife and she's all, Argh! but then she doesn't cut him. She cuts him free and then hands out a knife and says, here, defend yourself, you idiot. She doesn't actually say that, but that's the spirit. Yeah, Juliana was thinking that, though. And then, oh my gosh, okay, this is going to make me sound weird, but I don't care. I'm going to speak mm -hmm. my truth and stand in it. The moment when he is crushing Ivan's heart and he's like, do you like that, little man? I'm reading that thinking, oh, yes. Yes, I do. Yes. I like that very much. <laughs> FYI, Jeff likes that. Yeah, oh, my God. Okay, here is the thing about Tolia and Tamar. Tolia and Tamar are possibly the most attractive figures in literature. They are equally awesome. They mm -hmm. are equally hot. And strong and just kicking ass and taking names left and right. 
they're just the more I find out about them, the more they just they're so great. And then they cast them perfectly for I the know. Netflix show. And I'm not prepared. I am unprepared. Yeah, I am. The, I, I think I, most I, of I us are not, prepared. I cannot. There is. It is impossible for me to be prepared for that. When they show up on the Netflix show, I will several houses down. They will think a murder is happening in my house. I will properly lose it. Yeah, I'm very excited and to see that and also to just get more of these two characters. And it's just I love the dynamic of Sturmhan and his crew because they just they do whatever he asks and they're all just like genuinely nice people as well. Along with that, like they're their own individuals inside of the fact that they're part of his crew as well, which is something I feel like the Darklings crew loses their own individuality if they join him and kind of just have to bow down to whatever the Darkling says, whereas Sturmhan, his crew, they're a group of individuals that all work together. And like I said in the doc, Jeff, teamwork makes the dream work, right? Uh, yeah, it does. Yeah. Here's the thing about the Grisha that he has on the ship. Mm -hmm. You wondered how they ended up here, like how they found Sturmhan? Yeah, like how did they get here? Because they clearly have some kind of troubled past that led them to this point. I feel like he's a good recruiter. Mm -hmm. Like he's a person who travels. He's a person who pays attention. He doesn't just go to places, do the mission and then leave. Like he meets people. He gets to know them. He finds out how to make a connection with them. And then he proves to them that he genuinely has what is best you know, that's what's in his heart is, is their best interest, the best interest for everybody. Like he's that kind of guy. And yeah. that's why he, it's easy for him to get such powerful people to follow him. Like he's, he's the guy who puts together the crew to do the incredible, impossible yeah. jobs. Yeah. And, you know, the charisma is obviously there and we haven't figured out a super ton about him by this chapter, so I'm mm -hmm. guessing there's probably more about him that will make a lot of sense as we start to learn more about Sturmhond. Yeah, I'm remembering other things from other sections of this uh, Grisha verse as we're talking about this, Jeff, and what you're saying is definitely very intriguing to my brain at this point. So listeners, we'll talk about it as it comes to us, but stay tuned for more uh, Sturmhond tea as we go forward. Here's what makes me angry about this chapter. I want to be mad at Jenya and I can't. Why is that, Jeff? Do you understand that feeling? Yes. I want to... Well, I mean, okay, so... You hate her, but you can't hate her because you understand As at the her. end of this chapter, Ivan is dead because Tolia killed him, which, mm -hmm. FYI, I'm okay with the fact that Ivan is no longer alive, and I am especially okay with the fact that it was Tolia that killed him, because, again, that was weirdly hot. I realize that says stuff about me. I don't care. Don't care. If you, if you want don't to turn care. Jeff on, just go ahead and crush someone's heart. He'll love no, that. No! That is Physically, not the like, point. Take your hands and squeeze their heart until... They Till they are no longer a functioning human being, and Jeff will say, yes, please, thank you very much. You gotta stop <laughs> doing what you're doing. <laughs> Jenya gets very upset, which is understandable. She pulls out a gun and points it at Alina, and you and I both know that she wasn't going to shoot Alina. That wasn't the point. It was this instinct of what matters to me most is that things are okay for the Grisha and one of the Grisha I know just got killed and I'm angry and I need to react pulls out a gun but you don't pull out a gun on somebody you care about that much you don't do that because Alina by the end of the chapter she seems to forgive her and, and is begging her to come with them but she doesn't yeah. So that's the other side. Um, on the one hand, she pulls out a gun on Alina, but on the other hand, when she has the opportunity to abandon the Darkling, the Darkling's hold on her is too strong. So instead, she just holds them off while Alina and the others get away. Yeah, I think it just goes to speak to the fact that Alina and Jenga's friendship was real and is real. And as much as it started out as kind of a manipulative act initiated by the Darkling... Unfortunately for the Darkling, Alina and Jenya legitimately became friends and they have a connection and a 
now tainted more so love for each other but it still is there and it's sweet and i've realized the other thing that's a contradiction with jenya is that Mm. with if she hadn't i'm just gonna say this too if she had not suffered the kind of horrible inexcusable abuse that she suffered it would be so much easier to say that she deserves what is happening to her right now yeah just what's happening to her right now yeah specifically just in this moment specifically Mm -hmm. holding off the um nietzsche voya while the others get away Mm mm-hmm like that there is a small part of me that wants to say well you wrote the check now you have to cash it but every time i think things like that i think but she's been through this horrible thing that's impossible to understand unless you've been through it yourself so she's not in a good place to make decisions right now you can't be angry at her yeah it's frustrating yeah it definitely is she's someone who you have a lot of different feelings about as a character and they kind of contradict each other a lot of the time. So we're just going to have to see how that plays out going forward, Jeff. So the end of the chapter, Alina and Mal have gotten away with Sturmhund and crew and Mal is doing what he has done best so far in this book. He is being a cuddle bug and he is Mm -hmm. helping Alina to deal with her feelings by being a human snuggie. Yeah. And I'm okay with Mal up to this point in the, this book. Like, I'm at peace with him. I don't hate him right now. Don't worry. Because being a snuggie is all he has had to do. As yeah. long as that's his only function, I, I think that's probably, honestly, just being honest. That's why Yeah, you're okay with Mal. Yeah, he hasn't done had to do any multi any um a mentally complex work yet. Just I am person, me hug you now. You okay person, me hug you more now. Puff hug. <laughs> Puff hug. <laughs> yes, a, a nice little Voldemort hug for you right there. So that's chapters three and four. Yes, that is chapters three and four. So listeners, thank you so much for reading along with us. And next week, we're going to be reading chapters five and six of Siege and Storm. But before we sign off, Jeff, we're going to be playing a game. And I don't know what this game is, but we're going to play it because you're the one who said you had a game. I did say I had a game. And the best part of this game is that you can't possibly have seen it coming because I made it up. I did this with a friend yes. of mine when we were bored at work the other night, and the results were absolutely fantastic. Okay. I have tried to think of a way to make this directly related to the Grishaverse, and I haven't found a way yet. So until then, I'm just going to call this game Set the Scene. Okay. Let's, let's set the scene then. All right. So here's how we play this game. Mm-hmm. I give you an iconic, quotable moment from a hit show that I like. I will tell you what the line is, I will tell you who said the line, and I will tell you what show they are from, but I won't give you any other context for the line. You might know something Uh... about the show, you might not, but based on this one line, you have to tell me exactly what you think is happening in this moment, and then we'll see how close you get. What do you think? Yeah, I like this. Let's do it. Okay. So, here is the line. Forget it. Just give me all the bacon and eggs you have. Wait. Wait. I'm worried what you heard was, give me a lot of bacon and eggs. What I said was, give me all the bacon and eggs you have. Okay. That line was said by Ron Swanson in an episode of Parks and Recreation. Based on that and nothing else, Set the scene. I imagine that Ron is at the park, one of the parks that they host events at, you know, like with with one of those pavilions. And there's a gentleman outside there who's doing a breakfast for a, a, um, a fundraiser breakfast for a small child with cancer. And Ron has paid for a ticket to this 
fundraiser. And it was about $5, and it's an all-you-can-eat buffet once you pay for your ticket at the park where they're holding this fundraiser. And he is going to get the most out of his money. Thank you very much. He's supporting a small child with cancer, so he is going to be getting the most out of his experience at this charity buffet. And he's talking to the poor gentleman who is working the griddle at this buffet. And that guy is like, dude, they don't even pay me here. Like, th- literally, this is a volunteer job. I'm here to help kids with cancer. You need to just go away. <laughs> okay. So first of all, let me congratulate you because that is not the scene. Okay. But I've seen Parks and Recreation a lot. I have never seen a single episode in my entire life. Don't worry. When we visit you, and I have the entire series, I will bring it with us when we come to visit you in Massachusetts. I almost called it Connecticut. Don't tell anybody. I know you don't live in Connecticut. Don't visit me in Connecticut. You won't find me there. I did think not. So here's what's funny about it, though, is that the scene you just described could easily have been a scene from the show. Like, I could see that exact scenario going down. So you got the spirit of Ron Swanson down perfectly. Oh, good. Now let me tell you what is happening here. Okay. So the character of Ron Swanson, the the, the funny thing about his character is that he is the director of the Parks Department, so he works for the city government. But he does it as a kind of self-sabotage because he's actually a libertarian who believes that the governments should basically be abolished. So his goal in taking this job is to literally do nothing and by extension, bring the government down. He's a Mm -hmm. hilarious, very masculine and very endearing character in a funny way. Mm -hmm. But in this scenario, he and Leslie are traveling to Indianapolis to accept an award on behalf of the government. And he doesn't care about the award at all. He thinks it's a waste of money. But there is a steakhouse he wants to visit while they're there. And he finds out that the the health uh, department shut down the steakhouse. So he's horribly distraught. And after one thing and another, he is trying to drown his sorrows at a local diner. They bring him this very pathetic looking tiny steak. Mm -hmm. And before that line that I just gave you, he says, this is not a steak. Why would you call it that on your menu? And then he asks them for all the bacon and eggs that they have. Ah, okay. And I, ever since I saw that episode, I have wondered, do people, like, I've heard people in restaurants or in, like, bakeries, like, I've heard people, like, go into bakeries and say, give me all the glazed donuts that you have. Mm-hmm. And now in my head, they say, I'm worried what you heard was, I want a lot of glazed donuts. But I said to give me all the glazed donuts you have. Mm-hmm. Like if you have glazed donuts in the back that I'm not looking at right now, I want I need them too. here. Yeah, you bring Give them me here. Them all, every last one. I don't need that many donuts, but now there's a small kind of twisted part of me that wants to try that and see if it would work. Just ask for all the donuts and uh, just get them all. You better find someone who likes to eat donuts a lot, Jeff. If you do that. Tell you what we'll do. When we come visit you in Massachusetts, not Connecticut, over the summer, we will go into a bakery. We will do that. We will eat only as many donuts as we feel comfortable eating. And And then we will go run them off because while we're there, you're going to help me with my marathon training. Okay. That sounds good to me. Awesome. So that was our fun segment for this week. And even though Mm -hmm. it wasn't directly Grisha verse adjacent, I hope that you guys enjoy that because personally, even if everybody else hated it, I had a good time with that. I think it was fun. I think we could definitely bring that back and also use other shows too. I definitely could probably find some good quotes from like Disney Channel movies or like Hannah Montana and have you rewrite those scenes. That would oh, be fun. Oh, for sure. <gasps> oh so. my gosh. You know what we should do? What? We should play this with Mel. Because there's a lot of stuff that we've seen that Mel hasn't. Yeah, that's a good idea. We should play this. Also, Mel has a great sense of humor and a creative mind. And I just, she thinks about things differently. So I I would be very interested in knowing what she, like, I would even give her that same line, probably. And see what she came up with. She would not not tell the same story as me. I can tell you that much. No, I want to hear the story she would tell. 
Yeah, that'd be pretty fun. Maybe we'll do that later. So for last week's question of the week, we wanted to know if people would chew Jerda or not. This week is also an opinion type of question. This mm-hmm. is, uh, this one's, the last one had a little bit more humor to it. This one's thinking more about how the characters in the book make us feel. So our question for next week is, do you agree or disagree with Jenya's decision to stay with the Darkling? So what we're talking Ooh, about okay. here is when Jenya has just had this heartbreaking moment of she has seen Ivan die, she pulls out a gun on her friend, and then she is torn between going with her friend and doing what might seem right to her and staying with the Darkling and being attacked by Nichivoya. So if you guys have anything that you want to say about this question, we really want to hear it because we feel like it would give us a great conversation to start off our next episode. So you can DM us on any of our social media platforms or send us an email and just let us know how you feel about Jenya in this moment. Yeah. So thank you again, listeners, for joining us this episode. And next episode, we will be talking about Siege and Storm, chapters five and six. And... If you would like to listen to any other episodes of Into the Fold or tell your friends where to listen, we are on all platforms where pods are cast. And you can also find us over on YouTube at Into the Fold Podcast. And if you want to send us a message about our question of the week or interact with any of our other posts that are going up from our episodes, we're on Twitter and Instagram at Into the Fold Pod. And if you have a much more detailed, thought-provoking answer, or just have something you'd like to share with us, you can send us an email at intothefoldpod at gmail.com. And if you want to do something nice, because who doesn't want to do something nice, something that would help us out and make us smile, if you could leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, that way we can share them with our listeners on the show. And... If you really want to do us a solid, you can tell people that you know who you think would enjoy the show to listen because the best way podcasts are spread is by word of mouth. And we thank anyone who has shared our podcast thus far. So thank you to all of you. And until next time. Look over there. What? It's the fold. I'll see you in the fold. Bye. Bye. My audacity is being recorded. I am recording. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, 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 hello. Yes, Juliana. Juliana. Do you know how fun it is to say that now that we've heard it said that way? Juliana. In my head, I say it that way. Every time your name shows up on my phone, I don't just say, oh, look, it's Juliana. Like I say Juliana when I I talk about you to my wife. But when I I see your name on my phone, I'm like, oh, Juliana. 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 Like you need more A's and N's in it. But Jeff, I see yourself getting ready. Would you like to give us the news? What news? The, the news from the back? Is it? Is it back there? The news from the back? That sounds like really oddly sexual. That does sound really oddly. Okay, so how about the news from the front then? Better? Now that I'm thinking about it, that sounds like really oddly sexual too. But you know, that's what we called it already. But in the context of... Rutkowski. 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 Say it with me. Rut. Rut. Kos. Kos. Key. I don't want orange teeth. I will strict. Uh, Alina begins to. Hang on a second. Alina has heard a cat. Is that the the cat? The cat is saying, I love the Darkling. And then the Darkling says, Well, you know, cats are a little bit too self centered for me. They don't give me enough attention. Hang on. Where am I going? I don't know. You're going no, down on, the it. road of no return. Welcome to the road of no return. This is the road that you go down when you don't want to come back. One way tickets only. Going down the road feeling bad. And I'm going down the road feeling bad.